Hello everyone, how are you all? I hope all are fine. I am Rajiv Mal, your geography teacher. Again, I am here today with another video. I am going to teach all of you through a video and this video will help to you clear about this chapter. I hope you are more knowledgeable by going through this video. I will upload also solutions so you will download it and practice it at your home. Thank you. Chapter 3 Drainage the term drainage describes the river system of an area, not just river. If you make a channel through which water passes, that's a drainage over there. Now try to understand this in a bigger sense. Our earth's surface is not even, which means no two places are the same in terms of landform. Somewhere you'll find mountains, somewhere you'll see plateaus. The terrain is uneven. Now because of this, there is a change in the pattern of the rivers that flow. Their routing system is odd. It's not uniform, but ultimately they drain into a large water body such as a lake or a sea or an ocean. Now this place is called a drainage basin. Now let's read about the drainage systems in India. We know that the land surface controls the movement of rivers. Because of the broad relief features our country has, by broad relief features I mean the mountains, plains, plateaus, etc. You can see the odd looking pattern of the rivers of our country. Now let us shift our focus from their flow to their origination. The Indian rivers are divided into two major groups, the Himalayan rivers and the peninsula rivers. I'll show it to you on a map where they are. The Himalayan rivers originate in Himalayas and the reason is due to the melting of ice and glaciers. And rain is also a source but primarily it's because of ice and glacier. And on the other hand, peninsula rivers originate in the peninsula region which is right here. So this region over here was part of the Gondwana land. Therefore the rivers here are much older than the Himalayan ones. And since there is no ice and glacier over here, rainfall is the ultimate source of water behind the flow of rivers. Himalayan rivers are perennial, which means they flow continuously throughout the year. Ice and glaciers keep melting throughout the year. Since this is a mountainous region, hence the ice and glacier water passes and cuts through the mountains forming deep valleys and gorges. A lot of soil gets eroded. They get carried to the lower parts of this region and that's how over the time huge plains were formed. Most of the rivers of peninsula region originate in the western ghats and flow towards the Bay of Bengal in the east. And this is because of the shape of the landform. The western ghats are a bit higher in terms of elevation and this makes the river flow towards eastern side. And remember, only Tapti and Narmada are the rivers that drain in the Arabian Sea to the west. Rest all drains into the Bay of Bengal. Read about the Himalayan rivers in detail. The major Himalayan rivers are the Indus, the Ganga and the Brahmaputra. These rivers are long and are joined by many large and important tributaries. A river along with its tributary may be called as a river system. Now let us read about the Indus river system. The river Indus rises in Tibet near Lake Mansarovar. Tibet is in China, not India. Then it goes west in the Ladakh district of Jammu and Kashmir. Always remember, Indus first enters in the Ladakh district of Jammu and Kashmir. This entire portion is Ladakh. Here the land surface is uneven, rough. Due to that Indus breaks into several tributaries of Satlaj, Bees, Ravi, Chenab and Jhelum. South of Ladakh we have Zanskar range. What happens when you have so many mountain ranges? River will break its course and form many small tributaries. The Indus enters into Pakistan through Baltistan and Gilgit. In total, Indus has five tributaries, the Satlaj, the Bees, the Ravi, the Chenab and the Jhelum. They all ultimately meet at Mithan Court in Pakistan. Most part of Indus River is in Pakistan. We just have a little more than one third of its water. Beyond this, the Indus flows southwards eventually reaching the Arabian Sea from east of Karachi. So this was all about the Indus River system. Now let us read about the Ganga River system. Ganga starts from here near western Himalayas in the Indian state of Uttarakhand. Here you will find large chunks of glacier called the Gangotri Glacier. Here Bhagirathi is the name given to Ganga. So remember, Ganga originates from Gangotri Glacier and there it is named as Bhagirathi. As soon as it enters in Dev Prayag in Uttarakhand, here it joins the river Alakananda. After flowing 250 kilometers through narrow Himalayan valley, it reaches the plain area of Haridwar. Since Himalaya is a long chain of mountain from west to east, therefore many river channels are formed along its way which joins Ganga in its journey. Some of them are the Yamuna, the Ghagra, the Gandhak 
and the Kosi. They all come down from Himalayas and join Ganga in its journey. Yamuna and Ganga meets at Allahabad. You must have heard about this place called Sangam. The other three rivers that is the Ghagra, the Gandhak and the Kosi, they rise in the Nepal Himalaya. These three rivers causes flood at times and ruin the northern plain. And remember, northern plain is full of agricultural land, hence causes huge damage to the properties. From peninsula region, only three rivers join the Ganga. They are Chambal, Son, Betwa. They rise from semi-arid region, which means semi-dry region, and they are short and doesn't contain much water. So if in exam they ask, which are the peninsula rivers that join Ganga? They are Chambal, Son and Betwa. Always remember, the river Ganga passes through five states. They are Uttarakhand, UP, Bihar, Jharkhand and West Bengal. And these five states form the majority of northern plains. The Ganga flows eastwards till Faraka in West Bengal. Here the river is divided. Hooghly being one of the tributary flows southwards through the deltaic plains into the Bay of Bengal. And the main river Ganga flows towards Bangladesh and joins Brahmaputra and finally drains into the Bay of Bengal and this region is called Sundarban Delta. Moving on to the next one, the Brahmaputra river system. The Brahmaputra rises in Tibet, east of Mansarovar. Remember, Indus rises at the same place but moves towards west. It is slightly longer than the Indus and most of its course lies outside India. So see how much of it is outside of India. It flows parallel to the Himalayas. After reaching the Namcha Barwa, which is right here, it takes a U-turn and enters India in Arunachal Pradesh through a narrow valley of mountains. Here it is called the river Dihang and it is joined by other rivers such as the Dibang, the Lohit and many other tributaries to form the Brahmaputra in Assam. From there it enters Bangladesh near Dubri and heads towards south and finally drains into Bay of Bengal. Another important thing that you need to remember is that the river Brahmaputra causes floods in Assam and Bangladesh because every year during rainy season the river overflows its bank and causes huge floods and if you see the region of Assam and Meghalaya receive plenty of rainfall during monsoon and since Himalayan rivers are perennial which means they flow throughout the year hence adding an extra amount of water from rainfall causes huge devastation. So this was all about the journey of Brahmaputra. Now let's read about the peninsula rivers. So the main reason behind the water divide in peninsula India is because of western ghats. Because most of the peninsula rivers originate at this region. I'm talking about rivers such as Mahanadi, Godavari, Krishna and Kaveri. And due to the fact that western ghats is slightly elevated, the rivers flow eastward and drain into the Bay of Bengal. And these rivers also make deltas at their mouth. So if you see in these region you'll find many deltas. And this thing we have read it earlier. The Narmada and the Tapi are the only long rivers which flow towards western ghat into the Arabian Sea. Now let's talk a little about Narmada Basin. It rises in the Amar Kantak hills in Madhya Pradesh. And we know that this river moves towards the western side. And you will get to see some picturesque locations like the marble rocks near Jabalpur and the Dhuadar Falls. So near these areas, this river plunges over steep rocks, which means falls from steep rocks, creating a beautiful waterfall sort of thing. And then all the tributaries of Narmada are very short. And just remember that Narmada Basin covers parts of Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat. Now we'll read a little about the Tapi Basin. So the river Tapi rises in the Satpura range, which is in Madhya Pradesh and to be more specific in Betul district. And this river flows parallel to river Narmada, the one that we spoke about a minute back. So remember, uh, Narmada covered Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat, but Tapi covers Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat and Maharashtra. So if you see, the coastal plains between Western Ghats and the Arabian Sea are very narrow. We are talking about the continental shelf. And also due to this reason, there are a lot of ports on the western side than the eastern side of our country. Because on the eastern coast, the continental shelf is very long. And it's not idle to make a port in such a location. And now we'll read about the rivers going towards the eastern side. First, the Godavari Basin. So in the peninsula region, the Godavari is the largest river. So it starts from Western Ghats in the Nasik district of Maharashtra, then goes to Madhya Pradesh, then Orissa and Andhra Pradesh. And there are many small tributaries of Godavari such as the Purna, the Vardha, the Pranhita, the Manjra, the Vainganga and the Penganga. And just a quick fact, the city of Hyderabad gets drinking water from the Manjra. 
actually it's called Manjira and currently this tributary is dried up so the state government is trying to pull in water from some other tributary and hence there's a new water channel that has been made to deliver water to the city and the other name given to Godavari is Dakshin Ganga now let's read about the Mahanadi Basin so this river rises in the highlands of Chhattisgarh and it does not travel much it just goes through Odisha and reaches Bay of Bengal the famous Hirakud Dam is built on this river now let's read about the Krishna Basin so this river originates from Mahabaleshwar which is in Satara district in Maharashtra and then it flows towards Karnataka after that goes to Telangana and Andhra Pradesh and then finally drains into Bay of Bengal and some of the tributaries of this river are the Tungabhadra, the Koyana, the Ghat Prava, the Musi and the Bhima and the last river is the Kaveri Basin the Kaveri starts in the Brahmagiri range of Western Ghats which is in Karnataka and after that it moves to Kerala and then goes to Tamil Nadu and then finally drains into Bay of Bengal and some of the tributaries of this river are Amravati, Pavani, Hemavati and Kabini so with this we have covered all the rivers of Himalaya and Peninsula region now let's read about the lakes of India there are some famous lakes such as the Dal Lake which is in Kashmir and this place is a tourist spot some lakes are permanent and then in some lakes water is there during the rainy season only and obviously the permanent lakes have to be near the Himalayas because there the water supply is perennial which mean continues throughout the year and the temporary lakes are usually in the inland drainage which is in the interior of the landmass where water can be collected due to rainfall and obviously that place has to be a little lowland and lowlands are formed by wind, river action and sometimes human activities some of the coastal lakes are Chilika Lake, Pulikat Lake, Koleru Lake and there is another famous lake called the Sambar Lake in Rajasthan it is a salt water lake most of the freshwater lakes are in the Himalayan because there the glacier melts and the glacier water is very pure and fresh and then there are some lakes which are created due to the formation of a dam for example the Bhakra Nangal Dam which has been created on river Satlaj this dam generates hydro power and due to this a new lake was born which is called Guru Gobind Sagar so lakes are very important they help during rainfall because all the rain water can go towards the lowland into the river and it maintains the aquatic system it is also helpful to develop tourism so what is the role of rivers in the economy so if you see from ancient times civilization has settled near river banks and these settlements have now become huge cities so today we use rivers for irrigation navigation hydropower generation and since India is an agrarian country which means majority of the people are engaged in agriculture so rivers play a vital role in supplying water and thus adding economic value to the country now with modernization we are also polluting the rivers heavily all the domestic industrial waste and agricultural waste are going directly into the rivers all the sewage waste from household they are not treated and they are directly drained into the river and then we have industrial wastes chemicals they are also untreated and directly drained into the river and nowadays we are heavily using fertilizers and pesticides in agricultural field so all of this chemical mixes into the water and goes directly into the lakes and rivers so you see how much of pollution we are creating so just look at the paradox on one hand these pollution creating elements are very essential for urbanization modernization and on the other hand rivers being polluted nature being destroyed is also fatal for humanity and life on earth so this is a never ending debate hence we have to strike the right balance between the both and with this we have come to an end of this chapter